morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this um, Unlock Housing pre-election event. And I'd like to thank the candidates for coming along today. Um, I know your time is precious and really, really appreciate um, you being here in the room. Um, just to let you know, this event's being held in person and via Zoom. And I'd like to welcome all of our Zoom guests who are online. Um, I'd just like to check that you've all signed in with the COVID Safe app. We've got the um, cue card thing at the back. So if you haven't done that, please, um, if you could do that before you go. And also, if you could register your attendance at the front, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, if you could turn off your mobile phones, that would be fantastic. And uh, just a bit of housekeeping. If anyone needs to go to the bathrooms, uh, they're out the door to the that way, and then you'll see the signs. And if there's an emergency, um, we've got some staff here from the platform, if you could please um, follow them. So I'm Michelle McKenzie, I'm the CEO of Shelter WA, and um, I'd like to now welcome Auntie Millie Penny to the stage to do a welcome to country. So um, thank you, Auntie Millie. Good morning. Okay, this is a bit daunting here. Okay, Good morning, as I was intro intro introduced, my name is Millie Penny um, to um, Nyunga Mordia. Penny is my married name. My um, female lineage is that um, my mother is a Winma. My grandmother is an Indich. My great grandmother is a Yapo, and um, so on and so on. I was um, born on Nyungar Buja. Both my parents are Nyungar. And um, as a little girl, I um, used to be here in um, the city, Perth, with my um, grandmother. And um, met my Mort this morning um, on the Indich side. So I'm just doing Nyungar protocols, which is um, respectful because that's who I am. Because Penny's come from down the southwest, but us girls, we get married and change our names. <laughs> to cut to the chase, I'm Richard Wally's sister. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes, so now you know where I fit. <laughs> okay. Kai Wanju, Farm and Yorgas. Nyan, yay, yay. First of all, I would like to acknowledge elders that are present. Your um, dedication to family and community is cherished and respected. You are the ones that are challenging the systems, you are the ones that are upholding our protocols, our cultural beliefs. You are the ones upholding our community. And now sometimes our community is Winyan, but at least we've got you there standing. I also pay my respects to the elders that are past. It's because of the elders that are past, their dedication gets me to stand here today. And I truly acknowledge their um, passion, their drive and their continuous push for um, Aboriginal um, representation within decision making. And I also acknowledge the elders emerging. We continue to carry our cultural obligations by passing on knowledge, customs and practices to the next generation. Wanju Wanju Nyunga Buja. Ngan Buja, Nalak Buja, Nija Buja, Wajak Buja. Nalak Mort, Nalak Court, Nalak Weirin Buja, Nalak Kuringa Buja, Kora Kora Wajak Buja. On behalf of Shelter WA, I would like to thank um, Shelter WA for keeping up the practices and including um, Nunga welcomes to um, your forums. I haven't forgot you mob behind me. 
I do know we have um, many um, distinguished guests here today. I apologise for my back to you. Um, welcome, welcome. Nih, nih, mum and yorgas, wanking, wanking. Listen today because men and women are going to be talking and I think that talking is going to be in, in, in important. On a personal note before I close, I know what it's like to be homeless. My house burnt down last year and I had two, I have two little girls in my care and that was so traumatic to rebuild. But with family and with community, um, I got there. It's hard work to replace everything, but the emotional scars um, that stay with you and the stress of where am I going to cook these girls the next meal is real. Family took the children. I spent two weeks in hospital, but when you come out, you had all of those things to do and community rallied behind me. So I do know what it's like to have stress of not having somewhere to put your um, head on a pillow. So today I, I, I welcome you to have your say um, and be respectful. And it is, it is a big problem, but together collectively, hopefully that we can get somewhere. What a wank. God bless you. So I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annie and Millie. We're just blessed by your presence and uh, we just love the fact that we've got this ongoing relationship with you. So thank you so much. Now, I've got the pleasure of introducing um, Mr. Kieran Wong. Kieran's the chair of Shelter WA. Um, he was made chair last year and we're thrilled to have Kieran as a member of the Shelter family. So please join in welcoming, welcoming Kieran. Thank you. Gosh, that's quite low. Okay. Uh, thanks, Michelle, and thanks, Sani Millie, for that wonderful welcome to country. And I, I too would like to acknowledge that we're standing on Mabuja, country that was never ceded and has provided a safe and secure, sustainable home for generations stretching back to the old times. And I pay my respect to Indigenous people here today and to elders past, present and emerging. So Shelter WA is the peak body for social and affordable housing and for ending homelessness in Western Australia. And our vision is that all West Australians have housing that enables them to thrive. I think everyone here today would agree that access to safe, secure, affordable housing unlocks opportunity, enhances health and well-being, provides access to educational and employment options, and enables people to fully participate in community life. COVID has shown how governments can and must move swiftly to keep us all safe, and we need the same resolve to the housing crisis facing thousands of West Australians today. Shelter WA believes that everyone has a right to a place called home. Unlock Housing is our recently launched campaign and presents a united voice urging government to unlock the potential of all West Australians. The campaign has been developed in close consultation and full partnership with the sector, industry and people with lived experience. And I wanna thank in particular the principal partners, Anglicare, St Binney's, Nelson and Outcare. The three priorities that form um, uh, the Unlock Housing campaign and set us up for a brighter future are, we're asking for all political parties to adopt and urgently act upon. And those three principles or three core asks are, Investing in social housing and affordable housing, fixing the housing system and ending homelessness. Through strong stewardship, leadership and resolve from government and a collaborative partnership with the community sector and particularly people with lived experience of housing insecurity, we can ensure that everyone has a place to call home. Unlock Housing proposes an evidence-based, pragmatic and ambitious four-year co-investment package to leverage government, institutional, private and community sector investment to meet the housing needs of all West Australians. The Unlock Housing Coalition is proud to put forward a comprehensive package which over four years delivers 18,000 new social and affordable rental homes, takes more than 36,000 people out of acute housing stress and homelessness, upgrades 15,300 homes, including 8,300 solar and energy retrofits. There's a lot of thousands there. I'm sorry, but that you'll have to hear a few more of these. 
provides safe interim accommodation for 620 rough sleepers as a pathway to permanent home and wraparound services, supports housing policy reform across taxation and tenancy rights, builds upon the strengths of the community housing sector, whilst unlocking $2 billion of co-investment into social and rental homes from both industry and institutional investors. And underpinning this drives a statewide economic recovery, creating 32,000 jobs. I'd urge you all to visit the website, unlockhousing.com.au to find out more and to share amongst your networks. It's here also that you can find out about our homelessness and housing affordability community attitudes polling, which is being released today and will be available shortly on that website. But I just wanna to touch very briefly on a few of the key findings from that polling. Homelessness, affordable rental housing and social housing will influence two thirds of voters at the WA state election with 65% of respondents stating homelessness will be influential in their voting intention with 39% reporting the issue to be very or extremely influential. Homelessness in fact was ranked fourth behind the cost of living, crime and the public health system as an issue the community would like the state government to focus more upon. And West Australians overwhelmingly support initiatives to reduce homelessness and increase affordable rental housing and social housing supply. Four and five respondents polled noted their support for initiatives that reduce the incidence of homelessness and increase affordable rental housing in WA. And almost three in four would support initiatives that increase social housing in WA with only 4% strongly opposed. Homelessness as an issue in voter attitudes comes ahead of the global pandemic response, the public health system, unemployment, congestion, road infrastructure, public transport as an issue for government to focus on. And 38% of 18 to 34 year olds report that a lack of affordable housing will have a very influential or extremely influential impact on their vote. This recently commissioned polling by Shelter WA supports what we're hearing from our sector and individual members about the concerns and issues facing the state. And as part of that storytelling, I'm now pleased to introduce a short video featuring some stories or a story of West Australians who are living our current, you know, are living the housing crisis on a daily basis. first night of being homeless, it was actually really unsettling. Uh, we, we had headed to Perth and got ready um, with, with our family's support and, you know, we're getting our camper trailer and we arrived. We didn't know where we were going to be able to set up. Uh, it was the school holidays, so everywhere was booked out to be able to actually secure a campsite. So we just had our camper trailer and it was a bit, it was all unknown. Obviously with a baby, you know, we arrived, didn't know where we were going to be setting up. Um, it was we were all a bit on edge. It was quite unsettling, not knowing how it was all going to pan out. When our house went on the market, it had been a long-term rental. So when we first signed up, we felt fairly confident that we were going to be there for quite a while. We were hoping anyway. But I think with the current market in Margaret River, the owners just took advantage of uh, the raising house rates and decided that it was a good time for them to sell and let go of their investment. And so that kind of put us in the predicament of um, needing to move out when they sold the house. When we were notified, like the house was put on the market and it was sold on the first weekend. So we, it was quite a quick process. We then knew we, only, we had to get a house ASAP. So I was quickly looking on realestate.com and Gumtree and on Facebook, looking around to see what was available and there was just nothing. There was a few two bedroom houses and um, yeah, there was nothing really suitable for a larger family, we're a family of six. So that was a little um, confusing, I guess, and we were a bit unsure what to do when we started looking for housing. To have a secure place to live again, it just feels like I can get back into life. At the moment, I feel like there's a big pause button. Every night I go to bed with this worry of what is gonna happen. And so for me, I would love to get back into life because I do feel like it's put a big pause. Everything is a lot harder when you don't have a house. And so I would like to get back into living my life, creating my business and, and being with my family.
So perhaps most importantly, um, these stories are relatable by many in our community and stories like these spur us on every day at Shelter WA. Um, so we have very limited time. Uh, so that's it for me, you'll be pleased to know. Uh, I'd like to introduce our MC and timekeeper for the day today, Russell Wolf. Uh, and given our tight schedule, uh, he's a man who really needs no further introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Kieran. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, thank you. Can I say Kaya, firstly? It's wonderful to be here. Adi Mili, thank you. Thank you for making us feel welcome at your place. Um, I promise that we'll treat it nicely. And, and you made a really good point, I think. It's, let's be respectful. Let's be respectful. You know, uh, this, is a, this is a story that everyone cares about, and today we're going to learn, right? We're going to learn together. We're going to help each other. We're going to hopefully walk, work or walk together towards solutions. Um, and have you ever met anyone that thinks that we should have more homelessness? You know, it's, it just doesn't make sense. Um, so we're here. We're all here for the right reasons. Uh, let's enjoy this walk along together uh, this morning very well. My name is Russell Wolf. I'm delighted to be the facilitator, but I promise you my whole ambition this morning is that you hear far less from me and much more from uh, the, the guests that we have behind me. Um, if I can, I'll introduce each speaker as they come up to the microphone to share their thoughts with you this morning. But if I can just quickly acknowledge the, the guests that we have with us to speak, because uh, to get uh, two or three politicians together at a time like this would be an incredible achievement, I think. Um, and to have six of them is quite remarkable. Uh, there is, of course, an election around the corner which might have something to do with it, but it's a great thing for us that they're able to be here. So um, if I could just broadly say that we welcome the Honourable Minister for Housing, Peter Tinley. We welcome the Minister for Community Services, Simone McGurk. We welcome the Honourable Tony Christovich, the Shadow Minister for Housing and Community Services, as well as the Honourable Colin Holt, who is here with uh, his uh, hat as housing spokesperson for the WA Nationals. We have the Honourable Tim Clifford with us as well, who is a member for the member for East Metropolitan Region and housing spokesperson for Greens WA. And we also have the Honourable Alison Zamon, uh, the member for North Metropolitan Region and homelessness spokesperson for Greens WA. So broadly, could you please welcome all of our guests this morning? Thank you. If I can, just a, a, a little bit of housekeeping. We are keeping to a tight, a, a tight time budget, and I have been charged with the responsibility of keeping time, uh, which those of you that know me will know that I'm not good at it at all. Uh, but I will, I will do my very best. Each of the speakers has been told that they have six minutes to talk to you. And then after that, we'll have seven minutes of questions from the audience and when we talk about the audience there's an online audience that's watching us now and they're either zooming in or on Facebook live we welcome you and we're really happy that you're with us this morning please engage with us ask questions and we'll ask them on your behalf of our speakers when they come in and for the, those of us that are live in the room firstly lovely to see you and uh, thanks for coming out you all look splendid um, and uh, if you want to ask a question simply uh, raise a hand and either Michelle or Reese will come to you as a roving mic works in the room. Be patient. Can I say, I mean, we, we invite any question, but please, uh, because we're dealing with time constraints, uh, be mindful of that. Keep it perhaps shorter. Get to the point more quickly. I might have to be just like a fraction rude from time to time, and I apologise in advance if that's true. When the speakers get to the six minute, uh, the five minute mark, like, if you've ever worked in retail, that's like, oh, come on, will you come and come and get my sandwich? Uh, then uh, that's to warn them that they've got one minute left. Um, now, I think that's really just about it. Shall we get on with it? Terrific. Okay. So let me introduce, if I can, our first speaker uh, today, and he is the Minister for Housing, Peter Tinley. It's great to have uh, him with us this morning. He's the Minister for Housing, Fisheries, Veterans Issues and Asian Engagement. 
Uh, before entering Parliament, I think it's pretty well known that Peter served in the Australian Army for 25 years. He became the member for Willoughby in 2008 um, and has been working very hard on housing strategies in WA, which of course has something to do with homelessness as well. Would you please join me in welcoming the Honourable Peter Tinley. Thanks, thanks, Russell. Thanks for that. Um, can I, I too start uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners on whose land we meet and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And thank you, Arnie Millie, for that, uh, that, that very generous and gracious welcome and sharing some of your own personal story as well. Um, can I also thank Michelle and, and Karen for, uh, and Shelter WA for what has been a four year journey for me, well, probably even longer if you want to take it uh, way back when I was in the dark days of opposition, um, where Shelter was a, a, was a great support in terms of uh, helping me understand uh, what the challenges are when I was both as a shadow uh, member spokesperson for uh, for housing and of course the last four years. Somebody mentioned, one of my staff mentioned to me that uh, as we were coming down here that um, I'm the longest serving housing minister in the last uh, 12 years. So um, I don't know what that says, but um, I'm very proud of the responsibility that I've been um, given in the housing portfolio. And, uh, and as challenging as is, it's, um, it's certainly something I really do enjoy. Um, and again, thank you very much for that help in the last four years uh, with Shelter and Michelle. Uh, we in the McGowan government uh, really do believe in funding systemic advocacy, as uncomfortable as that can be from time to time, uh, as it should be uh, when we get sometimes the critiques that we need, not necessarily the ones we want. Um, I, along with uh, my colleague, uh, Simone McGurk, are responsible for housing and homelessness in the McGowan government. Uh, and we take it very, very seriously, and, and we are always looking for innovative ways. I can also acknowledge my parliamentary colleagues here, and, and we're all candidates, as it turns out, once those writs are, uh, are written, um, we're all out there uh, vying for a renewal of the, you know, what is essentially a lease uh, on this job. So we're really looking forward to the contest that's, uh, that's coming up as we lead towards the 13th of March. Um, I want to just cast your minds back, because it's been a hell of a year. Uh, last year, 2020, and you know, quite frankly, 2021 didn't get off to a raging start. Um, you could almost say that the first couple of months of 2021 were, were the concentration of uh, all that was bad about 2020. Um, but go back to 2017, when we uh, came to government, uh, we, we had a set, a set of atmospherics, if you like, economic mostly, uh, atmospheric, that were not reflective of what we currently have here now. Uh, house prices, for example, were in negative equity. We had a five-year down cycle in the housing industry. 7% um, vacancy rate, believe that right now, we're below 1% in vacancy rate. Uh, where we inherited $40 billion worth of debt. We had 8.6% uh, growth, expense growth in the recurrent fund. For what that means, what that means is we were borrowing to pay wages. We we're borrowing money on the market to pay wages. These are the sort of things that we had to attend to. We had the highest unemployment in the country and we had a, a net migration decline. So we didn't have any of those sort of hallmarks that we currently see now. You fast forward that to uh, our current year and our last 2020, uh, quite frankly, uh, courtesy of the, again, the mining industry generally, uh, significantly, GST of course, receipts and a range of other uh, um, uh, economic movements, we're seeing ourselves in a boom. There's actually a boom going on in Western Australia and uh, quite rightly it's more focused on the health and safety of Western Australians. That has been the prime focus and that's why you don't hear so much about it. And the very fact that we can gather together within a metre of each other without a mask in a great state like Western Australia uh, is its own advertisement for how seriously this government takes the future of Western Australia. Um, the housing and homelessness uh, portfolios are, are, are um, a multi-pronged uh, arrangement. Now, whilst I look after the majority of the provision of the bricks and mortar, if you like, and Simone uh, does much of the uh, service provision through her role as a communities minister, uh, is really an important distinction. There's the hardware, as I call it, which is the bricks and mortars and the software. You cannot separate the two. And that'll become evident uh, in a minute when I make a couple of points. Uh, but what have we done or what are we doing? Which is really, I just wanted to set that conditions. It takes time, nine to 18 months to build a dwelling. 
Uh, we had to attend to the, the fiscal wreck that we inherited. So we had to inform ourselves around budget discipline and we had to commit to it. Every minister around the table had to carry some water on that. Uh, housing was no different. And so as a result, we had to also make some significantly difficult decisions. For example, we took 300 dwellings out of the uh, available stock by one decision to demolish Brownlee Towers at Bentley, which was a relic of a past failed housing policy where we thought co concentration of, of people with the, the sorts of challenges that they have would be a good idea. Um, that took 300 out. Uh, getting 300 back is a, a very difficult task on top of that. So on top of the other challenges around the housing portfolio, that went quick, Russell. We built 1,000 new homes, what we, we, sorry, 750 new homes were committed to uh, as we stand here now, uh, um, and about 1,500 additional refurbishments. And the point I want to make about refurbishments, the majority of those were going to be demolished or disposed of. So by putting uh, about $80,000 of genuine refurbishment, we added 20 years to those. So uh, that is not included in those 750. Um, we've put um, over $10 million, or around $10 million a year into bond loans to allow people to get into the private market. And in the affordable area, we've, uh, we've increased Keystart's lending limits. We've put over $900 million of additional lending into Keystart, raised the income limits for $155,000 per family uh, to get access to a 2% loan. I can talk about that in more detail. I've also paused uh, and hopefully ceased in the fullness of time, the disposal of any further properties. The cross-subsidised model requires us to drive cash out of, uh, out of the uh, commercial operations of the housing division in the order of about 230 to $300 million a year to fund land acquisition and future building activity. Uh, we've stopped that, particularly as a COVID response. And my final point is don't forget Aboriginal housing. 164 remote communities from here to the West Australian border, uh, South Australian border are also within our responsibility. Thank you. Minister, thank you. Stay there because we'll get questions for you. Uh, you can stay at the, the lectern. Um, Peter Tinley has now uh, seven minutes. If anyone would like to ask a question, uh, we have a question uh, on the, the couch. The, We'll, we'll come to you in a sec. We've only got one microphone there, uh, 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 Mr. Bradfield. We'll come to you in a tick. Can I ask, I, I didn't mention this, but maybe if you introduce yourself and if you represent anybody um, to share that with us. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I'm, my name is Hope Alexander. I'm one of the people in the largest growing demographic of homeless people, the older single women. And I live in a rented property. It's precarious. I haven't had a lease for six years. But I'm disgusted at the proliferate parties who want to spend millions of dollars on bike paths. I say homes before bike paths, please. Forget the bikes. We need the houses, we need them now. Never mind putting them off forever and ever. Thank you. I'll take that as a statement, but um, I, I, I would say this, is that a government and a community at large is responsible for many, many outcomes. Um, uh, making sure we assist people to get off out of cars and into public transport and through things like bike paths, that's a fundamental requirement, I think, uh, of looking at a, a sort of a livable city. So they are integrated, in fact, not uh, separate. Um, thank you for that. Uh,
and you're in school for five minutes and get that disease. You know what I'm pointing out. And he never came back. There was a young man called Clinton Pryor, spirit walker who walked from the from Harrison Island across to, to Parliament House and met the Premier at the time. The Premier didn't want us to go to the front door. So he sent the message to the front door to tell us to go to the back door. To me, we was animals, we feel like animals. We went to the back door, we came to a garden where the minister and, 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 the, and the Aboriginal leaders stood there. And the first thing they said about WA, out the basic cart going in Calgary. We're not animals. We know how to build houses. Okay. Um, Herbert, thank you for that. And uh, we appreciate you being here and sharing your, your story and your pain. Uh, do you have a, a, a reflection? Or a... I, I do, uh, Russell. Th thanks, Herbert, for uh, for that. And I'm really am sorry. Okay. 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 Uh, and I, I do thank you for, for being forthright in, in bringing to us, you know, the challenges that you and your family face, and I really am sorry for your loss. Um, Aboriginal housing, if we all talk about housing generally, it's got its own context, but it has an extra special sharp edge when it comes to uh, First Nation housing. Um, the remote communities are, are one story, but then there's those that are even more disaffected in my view, and that's urbanised Aboriginal people who are, who are dispossessed in so many different ways. Uh, particularly my clients uh, in the in the 36 odd thousand uh, public houses. Uh, I live it as a local member. Any, any of these members behind us, they live it and understand it uh, through their constituency work in their own in their own seat. So uh, we are aware of the challenges, but the, the response is not just a government response. It's a t and that's why it's so great to have so many people here like this from the different organisations. It is a whole of community response uh, that we all take uh, various parts of responsibility for. Um, Herbert, thank you for being here. Um, can I just say, if you do ask a question, and, and what, your voice is very strong, Herbert, but unfortunately, uh, the people that are listening through Zoom, they didn't get it because it, it needs to come, but it's okay. Uh, it has to come. So, <laughs> um, uh, we've got only a couple of minutes left. So another question. Yes, please. Thank you, Minister. I'm Natalie Sangali. I'm from Access Housing over oh, here. Sorry. Um, uh, looking at Infrastructure WA's draft plan for the state, uh, one of their objectives is to make our state uh, an attractive proposition for overseas workers. Um, that concerns me from a social and affordable housing perspective. And I'd like to hear your views on how you think the state housing plan will accommodate the possible unintended consequences of pushing people with low incomes out of private rental and, and, and therefore having a need for social and affordable housing. Yeah, thanks. Uh, one of the things that is the economic dilemma of a small jurisdiction like Western Australia, the 2.6 million people, is uh, that, and we've got an internationally, globally focused uh, market facing industry in the resource sector at $115 billion. Um, small, small jurisdiction, even though it's a third of the continent, the small population often sits at the end of a whip tail. They make a decision left and right uh, on a particular investment or so on, and that increases the need for additional workers or reduces, and that's what I was talking in my opening comments about the down cycle that we, uh, that we were in in the previous five or six years. Um, the challenges of, of the dichotomy of that is that we do need that net migration um, for the fundamental growth of our state. We do need those skills to actually make sure they unlock or the enabling activities for the other for the other employment opportunities that we want to create. Now, the structural challenge here is this, um, that net migration and jobs growth are fundamentally important to actually keeping people off housing waitlist and out of housing stress. Um, but there's a national and if not a global problem going on in that uh, the bottom two quartiles of income are virtually structurally excluded from house, home, home ownership anyway. Uh, and increasingly, we've got a supply side problem we know that we went from 7% and underscores my, my point about the fragility of, of the cycle in Western Australia, we went from 7% vacancy to less than 1% in three years, four years. Uh, that's the sort of speed of the cycle that we have to work within. It compresses and expands all the time. We will take, thank you for that. One last question for Minister Tinley. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, Louise Jolito from Wacos. My question is in regards to the moratorium when it comes to an end in March. What is your government's plans? 
Uh, the moratorium that was put in place in order to protect people during uh, the, the crisis that we all now are very familiar with and live, have lived through, um, it has to end at some point. Uh, there are some, uh, uh, some concerning figures around uh, and whether they're accurate or not, as much as 20% rent increases and evictions that will come as a result of the end of lease, if you want to call them end of lease evictions. Um, they are acutely uh, focused, uh, particularly the Attorney General's looking at some of those, those structural issues that we might be able to attend to it. The reality is, uh, it is a part of that point about uh, supply side constraints. We are going to have a housing supply shortage regardless of what we uh, do or don't do. Um, our challenge is to actually do everything we can to support them, support the most vulnerable in that cohort. So we're working on it. Uh, whether it's going to be a comprehensive plan, uh, we'll see. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please thank Housing Minister Peter Tinley for being with us. Thank you, Minister. I, I should have included this uh, when I was giving you some housekeeping, uh, if you will. Uh, the time limits are six minutes for the speakers, seven minutes for the questions. Uh, please do use the microphones. Um, and uh, the, the only other thing is, is that because we have two ministers of the government here representing the ALP, uh, we have two Greens uh, MLCs with us uh, representing the Greens. We have one National and one Liberal Party uh, opposition members, or two, two one of each. Uh, we have uh, offered them the opportunity to have a slightly longer time to talk to us this morning, just so that the balance is right. Um, so. Uh, we have offered each of them uh, up to 10 minutes if they choose to use it and still seven minutes of questions. So I hope you agree um, that that is um, fair and it is, I think. Um, so thank you for that. And now our, our second speaker this morning is the State Labor Member for Fremantle. She is the Minister for Child Protection, Women's Interests, Prevention of Family and Domestic Violence, as well as Community Services. Prior to her election in 2018, Simone McGurk worked in the union movement for more than 22 years and has been a minister in the McGowan Labor government and has been very active in this field. I'm glad that she's with us this morning. Would you please welcome everyone, the minister. Thanks, Russell. Good morning, everyone. I'll just do that adjustment. Um, Great to be with you. And can I also acknowledge uh, the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and pay my very deep respects to their elders past and present and thank uh, Millie Penny for her uh, welcome to country. Uh, can I also acknowledge the Shelter Board and staff, my parliamentary colleagues and uh, all of those who are in the room and joining us online who work in this important sector, but also those people with lived experience who um, uh, sharing their own personal journeys so that we can improve uh, not only their, their individual response but our systems to get better outcome for some of the most vulnerable in our community. Uh, I've been thinking for a while uh, what I wanted to say today and I understand uh, the expectations particularly of a Labor government uh, and the expectations that that brings when we're um, in office particularly in areas of uh, very challenging social uh, need, such as homelessness. And while I'm sure some of my colleagues will have other things to say about the last four years, I'm actually proud of the work that we've done and the journey we have set apart upon together. Four years ago, the government approached uh, to homelessness uh, that we inherited uh, was frankly a mess. The system in WA was operating on a year-by-year -year contract with the sector, which were re renewed at the last minute. Services were being funded by two separate agencies. There was little or no direction on improving the system and supports for people in our community. And it was clear to us following feedback from the sector that significant change was needed underpinned by reform uh, in regard to policy around uh, housing and homelessness. Thanks largely to the work of the WA Alliance to end homelessness, we were able to start from a strong base. We took the time to collect the evidence and research through the Centre for Social Impact, and we listened and recorded the voices of those with lived experience. We consulted with the community right around the state, hearing from over 500 people through face-to-face -face consultations, online surveys and submissions. We also partnered with people like Deb Zanella, Michelle McKenzie, Louise Giolito, experts in the field, 
and many other sector leaders to develop a long-term strategy. And I have to say that the Liberal Party actually mocked us in Parliament and uh, outside of Parliament for this approach, to take the time to consult with the sector over the course of a year to develop the strategy. But fast forward to now, and thanks to the work of so many people here today, we have made huge progress. We now have long-term funding secured over the forward estimates. We have one agency develop, uh, delivering funds, and we have a clear strategy to collectively improve our effort. Over the second half of the term, together, we have launched the state's first 10-year strategy, this, this prop here, this strategy here, described as a world-class by shelter itself. We secured 72 million in new, new homelessness initiatives, including the development of two common ground facilities and the Housing First Homelessness Initiative. We've secured $150 million to increase the social housing stock through Peter Tinley's portfolio. And not only have we managed our way through an unprecedented global pandemic, but we've made the most difficult, we've made the most of a difficult situation by securing an additional $319 million for housing stimulus package as part of our recovery program. We've provided $159 million of funding through Lottery West to not-for-profit organisations and frontline delivery during this time. This included 198 grants worth over $21 million that has gone specifically to homeless services. And we've secured $6.8 million of funding to extend critical homelessness services as part of that recovery program. This money is actually starting to hit the ground now. In the week prior to Caretaker, we awarded $16.2 million of contracts to provide outreach services to support rough sleepers. Importantly, this included $6.8 million to a consortium of Aboriginal controlled organisations to lead work in supporting rough sleepers. This significant shift demonstrates our commitments to do things differently and to follow the policy processes we've set in place through the strategy. But there's one thing I'm most proud of and I think we should all be proud of. That is the way that we have seen government, the community services sector, the community and WA coming together to address this question in unity. Sure, have there been plenty of distractions along the way. These distractions have at, time, at times been misleading and frankly, unhelpful. We've responded in the best way we can, but we continue to press on in pursuing the goals and objectives we have all created. To suggest our work is just spin is to oversimplify what we know is a complex issue. It's not, it is not just not just that is what is being worked through on the ground, but also in terms of implementing policy reform. To suggest our work is not that complicated, to end homelessness is not that complicated, or that the McGowan government simply doesn't care about rough sleepers is not only naive, but offensive. In light of that, I look forward to hearing more from the other candidates about specifically how their parties intend to implement and fund their election commitments. Friends, our plan is clear. If re-elected in March, the McGowan government has committed $63.25 million in new funding for homelessness on top of those existing commitments that I spoke about earlier. $39.3 million to establish Perth's first Aboriginal short stay Aboriginal facility uh, to um, provide more temporary housing for those Aboriginal people travelling to Perth for medical, cultural, family or personal reasons. These have worked very well in other regional centres. Six million dollars to fund proposals that ensure more on the ground homelessness initiatives tailored to uh, differing local government areas of need, money to continue the delivery of street doctor and also um, to the, um, fund the um, 100 crisis beds which we did before we left. Um, uh, uh, went into caretaker. I've been thrown by those bells, um, Russell. Uh, look, yeah. uh, friends, I hope I can demonstrate to you that we are committing in significant new funds, but importantly, working in partnership with the sector to deliver evidence-based outcomes, which I'm confident will make a real difference to people's lives. Thank you. Um, stay where you are, Minister. Thank you for that.
Uh, Minister Samanga, Community Services Minister. A lot of people putting their, their hands up. We'll start. We've got one start. from online, have we? Hi, so we're going to start with a question from Zoom, please. Um, do you have any plans for funding of community-led housing projects? Well, just so we can understand what the portfolio responsibilities are, you had the housing minister here previously. It's his portfolio to, um, to fund uh, housing projects, which include community-based projects. So I think that question is better asked to the housing minister. It, it can be challenging where um, my portfolio has the responsibility for the services, as, as Peter Tinley said, his is the bricks and mortar. Um, it, what we do know is that vulnerable people experiencing homelessness or um, in, in all of its forms, people who are street present or who are, um, have precarious housing situation and are close to homelessness, um, uh, they don't. Their lives aren't, aren't broken up into portfolios. So we do need to have a, cent, a person centred approach, and certainly the Housing First uh, initiative is a good embodiment of that approach, where we make sure that our outreach workers who have a relationship with clients, people who are street present, uh, and identify the sort of permanent housing that they want and need source that permanent housing for them and then give them the sort of supports that they need for as long as they need it so that they stay stable in the in their accommodation and all the evidence across the world is that that's their best chance of giving people who are chronically homeless uh, the best chance of uh, that's the best chance of giving them a, a path out of homelessness um, thank you very much for that question uh, let's go to the floor yes hi Simone John Buffler from Community Employees WA Firstly, thanks for all you do and for all that you've done over the last four years. A couple of comments, or two quick comments, and then a question. Um, the end of the rental eviction uh, and job seeker, um, Minister Timley, I don't think we should underestimate the impact that's going to have. And I don't think we can just say, oh, well, that's the market, and the market's got to find its own equilibrium, because there are human lives at the back of this, and the consequences of that for thousands of people are going to be material. And it's up to the current government, albeit in caretaker, to have a strategy of what they're going to do about that. Um, my second comment is, I think there's an imbalance at the moment uh, in the spend that we have across infrastructure versus the spend that we have across social services. The level of investment in roads and in, and in roundabouts and in bus interchanges and myriad of things, they're all great, but there are people and lives that are significantly being impacted at the moment. So, quick comment. And then question to you, um, Simone. You said that um, funders have, or that providers have long-term certainty of contracts. I guess I'd like to challenge that. And we did have a meeting back in 2016 in Parliament House before you came to government, and uncertainty of funding was one of the key issues. We certainly see through our 155 members um, that there's still a significant uncertainty of funding. And in fact, in December, in the mid-year review, um, you announced, or the Department of Finance government announced an, uh, an extension of contracts, some hundreds of contracts for another 12 months, and some are getting an, an increase. But uncertainty as an employer is significant, and as an employee, I'd employ you with the strategic um, commissioning plans that your departments and across government are making, that we get some long-term certainty, because homelessness contracts have been rolled eight or nine times since 2009, year on year on year and we need to do better collectively. So, interested in your comments there. Well, there's a range of different issues that have been uh, raised there, John. One is about um, the impact of post the, the lifting of the moratorium, and we're acutely aware of the impact um, that um, that's going to have across the, uh, across the housing market. And, and Peter Tinley, I think, captured very well the challenges of the, um, of the heating up of the market and, and the constrained time in which that's occurred. Uh, I think there's two issues that we need to look at in regard to that. One is the immediate need of those people who have some sort of, um, who are going to be under pressure uh, when that moratorium is listed, lifted and what that means in the housing market. The other is in regard to the systems reform that we need to undertake to have better outcomes for those people who are homeless. And that's where We've done the strategy work. That's where we have a plan and we are putting in significant new funds, additional funds, uh, to, um, to address that issue. And uh, I, as, I, as I've said, and I, I take 
the sector at its word when it says that we, uh, the, all the advice I'm getting is that that is the correct strategy and we are putting new funds into addressing that. What we're also doing is addressing some of the feeders of homelessness. So um, our government's focus on domestic violence, on countering domestic violence and putting in place uh, new funding across the continuum to address domestic violence is another area that I'm very proud of. So yes, there is a lot to do. Um, we went to the sector before the last 2017 election and asked what are the questions, what are the issues that you want us to raise and, and to implement in government and we have implemented all of those things that we said that we would do. The default position now for um, funded services is a five-year contract. One of the challenges is where there is reform needed, um, how do we do that? How do we tailor those existing contracts through reform into five years? But that's our default and we're working very closely with the Department of Finance. Jody Cant now chairs the Supporting Communities Forum um, with, um, uh, with the community sector to uh, in partnership to address some of those challenges. Um, thank you for that. We probably only have time for one more question, I'm sorry. Minister, good morning. Jonathan Shapiro from the West Australian Council of Lived Experience. Look, I congratulate in regards to what you've done over the four years. Yes, it was a mess from the previous government. I was one who was actually on the street during the previous government's uh, term. Um, look, the West Australian reported in September last year to do with the deaths on the street and we were looking at it pretty close to really one a week, and they were the statistics that were released from UWA, from Associate Professor Lisa Wood. Now, Paul, uh, uh, Basil Zemplis, in his campaign for Bear last year, spoke about the actual initiation of getting the bed down complex going in West Australia. My question really is the fact that temporary solutions like this are going to help uh, alleviate the problem as far as deaths on the street are concerned. And I work with Herbert in regards to the fact that the um, uh, Indigenous deaths are getting to the stage of being quite horrific. But in 2020, we saw 45 homeless deaths on the street. What is your government doing in regards to actually stopping this and getting something going so that we have a solution that is viable? Um, the situation with the, um, obviously, people who are dying, it's it's... I don't think that is anything new, I have to say. I think that the, the shameful health outcomes and life outcomes for those people who are street present um, has been um, very obvious for a while. And I don't need to tell any of you that, either, either yourself, Jonathan, or any of the sector. As I said, we need, we need to look at the immediate situation that's before us, but we also have got a framework to reform the system so that we can get better outcomes for those people who are street present in stable permanent housing and the supports that they need. And so one of the dilemmas that we have is that people say, yes, those long-term outcomes are all very well, but we've got a crisis situation now. And that's, that's true, we do have a crisis situation now. And we have um, demonstrated that we are releasing money either through Lottery West's um, has made those decisions or through the state government to make sure there is more capacity on the ground to not only give people accommodation but the supports that they need in that accommodation. And to get that, to get that tension right, to get that balance right is a challenge that we need to continue on the reform for long-term outcomes, the best chance of long-term outcomes for those people who are chronically homeless, but also to respond to the, to the immediate situation and I, I outlined, for instance, an Aboriginal short stay accommodation I think will be very uh, welcomed in Perth, uh, more money to street doctor um, and um, more money to Aboriginal controlled organisations who are best placed to work with some of those clients. Yes, there is work to be done, but we have to keep our eye on both of those areas, the immediate need as well as the reform and, and um, staying the course with developing long-term outcomes, uh, those solutions which, which will have the best chance of long-term outcomes for those people who are cu currently um, some of the most vulnerable in our community. Uh, Minister, I wonder if you'd be good enough to take one more question, please. Yes. Hi, my name is Donna Barnett. Talk, um, just just in into the mic, Donna. Hi, my name's Donna Baines. I'm representing some of us people that are actually homeless. We're staying in Perth City Apartments at the moment. D-Day is today. We've been promised since Perth City, we were living under a bridge. 
We were promised money for homelessness. Where is that money and where are we going to go tonight? Because we're physically being kicked out today. Where is that money? How is going to help us today? Where do we go on? Address this for us now, please. Where do we go? Can I just confirm, has anyone offered you to take you to other accommodation tonight? Um, that, that's not what some of the services I spoke to, Uniting WA and to Uniting, Uniting WA and to Wanjining, as well as Department of Community staff who are available at Perth City and we can take your details here to make sure. To make sure that there, there are all... Okay. All right, Minister. Um, so, can I just make clear yeah. that there, there is accommodation available if you want to take it. It won't be in Perth City Apartments. It will be in other accommodation, and that will be for you. So... Okay, I, 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 as much as I appreciate it, and it's all happening off microphone, which means it's not going through uh, to the people that are being part of this forum online too. Uh, to be fair to the minister, you know, can we say that um, you'll, you'll chase down the details re related to these people and see if you can assist them? There is accommodation available for you if you want it tonight in hotels. So we will, we will work with you to make sure it is close yeah, that's right. I, okay. I understand that you're in a wheelchair and I understand that you have specific requirements to be close to rural Perth. We will work to get you okay. something that is a com that is um, suitable for you. Thank you for asking your question. Thank you for being here, Minister. Thank you for your responses. Uh, please, everyone, uh, Simone McGurk, the Minister for Community Services, would you please thank her? Okay. Uh, now, it is uh, my pleasure to be able to introduce you to uh, somebody who has represented the electorate of Kareen since 2008. And I think the, the reason that he is here will make very good sense to you shortly. Uh, he became WA's first Shadow Minister for Homelessness in 2019. In July of last year, uh, Tony Christovich was appointed to a newly created portfolio as Shadow Minister for Cost of Living in response to the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, he is also the holder of the Shadow Housing Portfolio. Uh, he is the Minister of, uh, sorry, the Shadow Minister for Community Services, Youth Housing, and assisting the leader in health, as well as the opposition whip. Would you please welcome to the microphone, Mr. The, sorry, the Honourable Tony Christovich, MLA. Welcome to you. <laughs> thank and you get 10 minutes, just thank, to be thank clear. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here. Can I firstly start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, their elders past and present. And Auntie Millie, thank you very much for that welcome to country. Can I also acknowledge each and every one of you, the uh, key stakeholders and the delivery of services providers here in Western Australia, and the amazing and unique job that you do every single day under difficult circumstances where from my perspective over the last four years, when I've looked at this sector more closely, you're definitely under-resourced and, and un undervalued in terms of what you do. Obviously to Shelter WA, uh, congratulations on your 40th anniversary and putting this forum together. Um, one thing I want you to do today is think about the last four years and think about what the Labor Party has delivered over the last four years to each and every one of you, to your organisations and the sector more broadly and judge them on their actions, not on their words. That's very, very important. And I want you to think about also your relationship with the previous uh, Barnett government as well and how that was working for the sector and the things that were happening in each of your organisations at that point in time. I'm glad that uh, John clarified the issue about the one-year contracts because even though there is a policy announcement a number of years ago saying five-year contracts, there are so many organisations that still have one-year contracts. And even though there might be a review underway, 
everybody should have got a, a five-year contract subject to a review, finding out anything different that might have happened. That would have been the obvious choice and the obvious way forward. And just to uh, correct uh, Minister Tinley, I think the budget papers uh, in 2016-17, three months after we uh, lost the election, uh, showed a uh, debt of $32 billion, not $42 billion. And if you reflect back uh, then, GST was uh, under 35 cents in the dollar. Now it's uh, about 75 cents in the dollar and iron ore was uh, under $60 a ton, whereas now it's $160 a ton. So with those few fixes uh, that came into place, obviously rivers of gold have started flowing into the state in terms of uh, financial uh, capacity. And obviously that's been reflected by the massive investments that the government has done. And in terms of the sector, well, again, if the government was doing such a great job, then in December, 2019, you wouldn't have had the Your Help WA campaign saying that the sector was in pain, was suffering. The equal remuneration order uh, was uh, cutting back on services, cutting back on funding, and uh, the government had no interest at the time to top up funding as far as the ERO goes. Obviously, uh, after that campaign and through political and uh, pressure from the media, uh, some funding was uh, brought forward and that was fantastic that that was finally done. Uh, let's not forget that the, uh, the same situation occurred under the Barnett government when he made $600 million available to fix up the ERO situation at that point in time. Uh, and let's not also make it as insignificant, but there are billions and billions of dollars flowing into this state now from iron ore and from GST and from stamp duty. And we can see the budget surplus uh, for this year growing by a billion dollars on a very regular basis you know a couple of weeks goes by they say it was 1.1 then a month later oh, it's 2.1 now then a month later oh, it's 3.1 now so there's a ton of money coming into this state that's available that people didn't know about um let's not also forget uh that uh the premier has repeated a number of times uh, that this election that we're going into is going to be very close very close election he's very concerned about the, the closeness of the election and of course the, the premier would do nothing but tell the truth uh, about as far as that's concerned. Uh, and you know, when you look at commitments, and I think you've uh, hit the nail on the head, if you go around the 59 seats around this state, every single seat, including my state, the seat of Kareen, there are commitments coming from the government for tens of millions of dollars into each of those seats um, to obviously try and secure a victory in those seats to win marginal votes. Uh, and uh, so they are, they are massive commitments. Even in my state, seat of Kareen, there are millions and millions of dollars. Uh, so therefore, it tells us that there is lots of money around uh, and it all depends on how much your value is to the particular party that's trying to get your vote. And so I suppose I ask you and I reflect on the fact that my assumption would be that each and every one of you would be getting massive commitments and your bank accounts would be being filled at the moment because there's lots of organisations in my electorate and other electorates that are getting massive amounts of money given to them. Um, not just roads and others, but also infrastructure projects. So what's your value to the Labor Party? And what's your value? What's your vote actually worth? I think that's something that's worth considering. And a social dividend is important. We do need a social dividend. Uh, we've had so much money coming into this state. Things are getting worse. They have never been good, but they've never been as bad as they are now. Um, you know, so that's obviously something that each and every one of you can reflect on yourselves because you're in that unique position to know whether that is or isn't the case for your relevant organisations. We know we've got a housing crisis. We know we've got a mental health crisis, the homelessness crisis. Well, it's one tent city after another. And of course, it's always someone else's fault. It's always someone else's fault that thousands and thousands of homeless people on some occasions find themselves together in one particular location to uh, make that problem seem bigger. Well, seem big but in reality just those 10 cities are only a fraction of what the real problem is out there but at least they attract attention and they get a focus on the sector and you know you hope that they'll get a commitment but you can't blame other people for homelessness you can't blame other organizations other individuals it's a problem that exists it's a problem that every government faces but this problem government hasn't dealt with it as best as it could because there has there was budget cuts over in the early years uh, to homelessness support services and those budget cuts have not been reversed and when I reflect back on the Barnett years, um, you know, apart from the $600 million, what tangible things can I look back at? I can look at entry point being created. I can look at the Tom Fisher House. I can look at Foyer Oxford, the Beacon, Ruamaya Women's Refuge, Stewart House, the Ellen Brooks Family Support Centre, the Kalgoorlie Aboriginal Short Stay Centre, 50 Lives, 50 Homes. There were so many things that were being done and none of them were election commitments. None of them. They were just things that the government of the day said needed to be done. The sector approached the government of the day and they were implemented. It wasn't about 
around election time, what are we going to do for you now? It's about identifying this problem and saying, we need to do something. We have a moral obligation to do something. And, you know, we did a lot, but we still didn't do enough. There is a lot more that needs to be done and a lot more that could be done if people were put ahead of, and social infrastructure was put ahead of, uh, you know, other, other sorts of infrastructure, physical infrastructure. And we need to invest in our people, it's important. You can see mental health in our youth. You can see all these issues that are, that are, that are destroying the fabric of our society and we're not really giving it what it deserves. And, and that's really disappointing for me um, as the shadow minister in this space. And I find it extremely um, sort of, it's painful actually to see it. And you listen to people's lives and, and what they're going through and you think, you know what, we can do something about that. But then you say, well, hold on, but there's a vote to be gained over there by giving something to some other organisation. So we'll go for the vote instead rather than trying to help people. But by fixing up the fabric of our society, the whole community benefits. We get all these individuals back on track. And, you know, homeless people, um, you know, they're not these down and outs that some people will have. They're the normal people that have come under hard times and the support services weren't there for them. Either they didn't have the family or they didn't have the other supports or they lost. I mean, it, it is a complicated area. I, I always acknowledge that, but we can do a lot about it. And, you know, that's why it's, it's one of the areas that I'm going to keep being passionate about in the next four years. You know, it's pretty obvious uh, who's going to win the next election, but I, for one, won't be letting them off the hook in terms of uh, ignoring the sector and ignoring the outcomes that need to be developed. We know, and, you know, the Minister for Housing said about, you know, demolishing Brownlee Towers. But we also know that 1,155 homes were sold. Hundreds of millions of dollars were gained. You know, we went from about 44,000 social houses down to 42. So we didn't grow the social housing stock. We know that in the last year of the McGowan government, sorry, in the Barnett government, about 1,000 houses were built or purchased. And every year since then, under this government, it's been about 50 or 60 a year. So we were building th you know, up to 1,000 a year, um, and now we're building a, a, a trickle effect of that. Uh, you know, domestic uh, violence, is a growing problem. We, we've obviously got our first ever Minister for Domestic and Family Violence, and yet the problem is getting worse. And the support services, yes, there might be some commitments now, you know, the election around the corner, but where's the last four years been? And why haven't we been focusing on these things continually? Because that's what creates the problems. We know that, you know, 40% of our homeless people are victims of domestic and family violence. So if we resolve that, that's gonna help with 40% of the homeless problems. There's so many things that we can do if we want to do them. And I know, um, and John over there came to me about domestic and family violence support services, you know, with the ERO, and the fact that they had to get the, they had to cut resources, cut their delivery of services in 1st of July last year, because they weren't getting a top up of their funding. We had to run a campaign through parliament, I did, and I wasn't even, I'm not even the shadow minister for that area, but I ran, we, we, we debated in parliament and uh, the government at the time voted down the uh, motion in parliament to give domestic and violence family support services extra funding as a base, based on the ERO. Obviously uh, on reflection sometime after that debate, I think they did increase the funding slightly. So, uh, you know, the, the debate in parliament worked, but it's also about you as the community sector holding us as politicians to account and telling us that your vote counts the vote of the people you represent, your families counts, and no one should take it for granted. No one should take it for granted. And they're not trying to buy your vote. They're trying to buy a bit of humanity and, and put you know, life back into people and get them back on the straight and narrow. So it's not about trying to win votes. It's not about trying to secure a victory. And this is where we need to work collectively as a parliament to say, you know what, some of these things we need to do in bipartisanship, and we need to put the funding on there. And lots of times I'll say to the government, I support that idea. I support that initiative. Uh, you know, Housing First was announced in 2019. The first contracts and funding has been allocated in 2021. That's a long time. It's been talked about a lot, but no money was put on the table. Common ground facilities, you know, that's been talked about for a long time as well. Probably the first one won't be open until at the, at the end of the next election. So, you know, there's lots of things I can talk about from that perspective, but we need to become more accountable uh, as a parliament and as politicians, and we need to put people before profits. Thank you. Thank you. Stay there, please. Uh, uh, Tony Christovich, MLA, um, thank you for being with us this morning. Um, and uh, we have uh, the same six or seven minutes for questions. If anyone would like to ask a question of the honourable member. Thanks, Russell. Uh, Kim Stone, Tony. Uh, I'd like to make a few observations and really put a proposition to all uh, the political parties with us today. Uh, first observation, Minister Tinley is absolutely correct that it's not just the government who needs to be involved, it needs a, a heavy involvement from the community. 
certainly the statistics from the survey uh, Shelter WA did recently has indicated there is a great deal of concern within the community and I think that can be leveraged off. Uh, second observation, this country is fairly good at handling natural disasters. Uh, you've only got to look at the recent Wuralu uh, bushfires where Ron Edwards, who heads up the State Emergency Council, I think it's called, is actually leading the response and presumably well supported by a team. So it's a task force approach. Cyclone Tracy, which levelled Darwin, I think Christmas 74 from, from memory, I think Peter Crossgrove led the charge there. Um, what we have here in homelessness and social housing is a social disaster. It's not a natural disaster, it's a social disaster. So what I'd put to all of you parties, or the other observation I'd make is yes, we, we hear about the delays between funding being promised and things happened on the ground. That is reflective of the very slow pace at which government organisations move. And I speak from experience, having been a general manager in a number of government organisations. So I put it to you, and I, I seek your agreement that irrespective of who wins a government in the next election, that you will create a task force uh, to pro provide sufficient focus on this issue and get serious about it. Um, thank you for that. More of a statement than a question, but I wonder if you want to respond to it. Oh, oh, look, there's no doubt that we need to take this issue more seriously than we have been. And, uh, you know, I'm, again, happy to do that in a bipartisan way. I think we all need to be involved. I don't think there's anybody that doesn't want to solve this issue, but it's a matter of the government's got the purse strings. And when they get an extra billion dollars or $2 billion in uh, own or royalties coming to the state that they didn't know about, why not slide a billion on the side and say, you know what, we're going to take this issue seriously. There's a billion dollars we're going to slide on the side rather than throw it around the community to try and get extra votes or build things that, you know, aren't as important as building the fabric of our society. So, yes, it can happen easily. If the government was to say that once they, once, if they get re-elected, you know, we're going to throw a billion dollars on the side, I'd be the first one raising my hand saying, I'm, I'm with you, boots and all. Thank you. Another question. Hi, my name is Deborah Ralph Caffarella. I'm a visual artist who provides education around human rights in this, in our culture. But I also am somebody who it, uh, has been a manager in many services provided to those who are displaced and those who with housing vulnerability and homelessness. And I am still doing things like that on the ground, but I also myself am in a position where in May, I, my owner of my property is actually needing to sell because they reassess their retirement. So I'm a mother with three children still at home. And at this present time, uh, I don't know where we're going to go. I'm professional academic with still striving to get um, employment. And I, I work very hard at trying to have job opportunities. So sorry. No, no, don't be sorry, take I the breath. I just want to acknowledge my brothers and sisters and their stories. And I've got a question. I would like, not only the government, I, first of all, I want to say thank you to all the services and their incredible work. And I think COVID-19 put, has put so much pressure on the services and on the government. I know when this current government first came in, they actually didn't have any money because the previous government was in debt. And I know that they were starting from nothing. So thank you for all the work that you have done in the last four years, but I know there's so much more to go. I believe that the biggest problem here is lack of housing, public housing, fundamentally, and from a person of personal lived experience, but I also, I want to ask a question. Now, the question is, what contingency plan does the current government and future possible governments have in place for the incredible crisis that is going to occur after March when the rent moratorium is actually going to be lifted? Because I can tell you there will be families, many families on the streets, and oh, I could be one of them, I hope not, but please do something. Don't just hope that the services are going to do it. What are you going to do? Thank you. And, and look, what, what I will say is you are 100% correct. And I'm very sorry to hear your story. I, I can say the reason why I'm so passionate about this area is because I have family and friends also who are in similar situations and I've financed uh, at least two people to make sure they didn't end up getting homeless that were obviously friends and family of mine. 
And so I see what's going on and I don't see an answer or a solution. Now, I can't look after them long term, but there is nothing there for them. There's nothing there for you. There's not enough. So we either take this seriously or we become like Seattle and all these other cities in the world where we just have these tent cities popping up. People live on the streets and, and that becomes a normal way of life. And for someone with children, you know, that creates a cycle of poverty, a cycle of suffering, mental health issues and everything else. So, look, the bottom line is we either take it seriously or we don't. The government of the day, when they get elected after this next election, needs to make a decision. You'll see that very quickly. If they throw money your way and their and, and they're, you know, boots and all, that's your number one priority, which it should be. Um, then you know they care. If they don't, if it's more of the same, takes four years, five years to get things done. You, you, you know the answers. You're in the frontline services. Your organisations get or don't get the funding. You can see the pain and suffering out there. I don't need to, as a politician, tell you what's going on. You tell me what's going on and you tell everyone else what's going on and you know it a lot better than I ever will. Um, thank you, Deborah, for the question. Uh, we have got time for one, one more. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sarah Patterson and I'm from Midless. Um, the question, uh, you'll have to excuse me. I, d I don't know why I feel so agitated, but I do. Um, I'm still not clear what it is you're saying your plan is, what you're going to do if elected. I'm, I'm not sure what solutions you're putting forward or what, what's the plan. I, I can hear that you're passionate about it and you've acknowledged repeatedly yep. that it's a problem. What's the plan? Yep. Well, well... Um... And, and that's and that's a very that's a that's a very very good question. Um, uh, two observations I'll make. Uh, the first one being, well, we uh, we will be having an announcement later this week on the housing strategy. In terms of the short term, uh, let's call them interim common gown facilities, by working with shelter and the not for profit sector, we put fifty seven point five million dollars on the table to offer five hundred beds over five years to get people off the street straight away and then try and obviously through support services, transition them back into home or back to family or whatever it might happen to be. So that was the first thing. So uh, according to the sector, the conversation they had with me, $57.5 million will take 500 people off the street straight away uh, with support services for five years, right? That's a short-term solution. Now that 500 becomes thousands because obviously not everyone will stay in there for five years. People will transition through support services back to family, back to country, back to where uh, hopefully into a home. Then there's the housing scenario that comes after that and obviously having enough homes and building homes. And, and that's important as well. And so we'll have uh, something to say in that space as well. But if the, if the situation isn't dealt with seriously, then this problem, you're right, will get worse and nothing will will improve and, and the consequences of that are dire. So it's really about the government of the day. And, and like I said, you know, unfortunately, I'm, I don't think I'm gonna be the government of the day. So, um, you know, whatever I say, unless these guys are prepared to match it, if I said to you, I'm gonna build 10,000 homes uh, in, the, in the first two years and they don't agree to that, it's not gonna happen. Nothing's gonna happen. So when I come out with my policy, it's got to be something that pushes them a little bit further in the right direction. But I can't be, as much as I'd like to say, I want to build 20,000 homes tomorrow, the reality is they're not going to do that. So the question is, I've got to come up with policies that head us in that direction, but also, you know, offer other op opportunities, which the sector supports, which can hopefully then be achieved. Um, everyone, would you please thank Tony Christovich for being with us today. The Honourable MLA Shadow Minister for Community Services, Youth, Housing, um, and also the Shadow Minister assisting the Leader of Health, uh, the Leader of Opposition Health and uh, uh, Opposition Whip. There we are. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Our next speaker, uh, everyone, is the member for the Southwest Region representing the Nationals in WA. Uh, the Honourable Colin Holt has represented the Southwest Region in the Legislative Council since 2008. He's previously served as the Minister for Housing and is currently the Nationals WA spokesperson for housing, culture and arts, racing and gaming, forestry and women's interests. Please, would you welcome everyone, Colin Holt. Thanks. Uh, thank you, everyone. And please, um, could I just acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we meet today. Um, and yeah, well, let, let him speak first and then uh, there'll be questions at the conclusion. Herbert? Okay. 
No, we, we're going to, we're just, this is the format that we're running her, but that's all. You let the, let the speaker speak first. Okay. Please go ahead. So, so my acknowledgement to the traditional custodians of land which we meet today, including their uh, leaders, past and present, and also emerging who are going to, uh, to lead this great nation. Just a bit of background to myself. I've lived and I've worked in every region of Western Australia. And I hope that there are some people online from regional Western Australia. Um, my background is in community development. And obviously, as a national spokesperson, I'm going to be focusing on some of the regional issues today. Um, and just uh, as a bit of context, I'm actually not recontesting this next election. So um, I've been there for 12 years. I've, uh, it's time for someone else to have a go in this role and for me to go and contribute to our great state in some other way. So. Um, different to the other speakers, but um, interested in this issue. Um, about 14 years ago, I was working as a community development officer, and I did some work with a small town in regional Western Australia in the Eastern Wheat Belt. Um, and it was around community safety. And I met up with some locals there who told me a story about a Homes West, as they were called in those days, had a house in, there were, there were a small number of um, homes west owned houses in this small town. And often people would get sent there from out of town, out of the region, um, because there was a roof over their head. Often the local community would rally together, gather furniture, often though people rocked up with absolutely nothing. Um, often furniture, often clothes, often food vouchers to assist with the person who came to that empty Holmes West house. Um, I think the story they were telling me was about a young woman who was a small family, probably um, escaping from a family violence situation. And she was so desperate for a house, a roof over her head and a house that she was willing to go 200 kilometres to a small wheat belt community for that opportunity. But of course, the local then told me that one day they were driving to a regional centre about 120 kilometres away and this young woman was pushing a pram trying to get to the nearest Centrelink office, uh, walking, hitchhiking to try to get there. It highlighted to me that this issue is much more than just a roof over the head. It's about adequate, appropriate, available services that go with it and we need to attack we need to tackle this issue on, on both of those fronts. It also highlighted to me that I think homelessness is a very individual and personal issue. And we need to work with individuals at a very personal level to try to solve the, solve the problem, to find out exactly what they need in terms of services and a roof over their head, because it's going to be different for each of them. Um, now, one of the biggest challenges in Western Australia is to ensure that there's those appropriate services in every corner of our state. No, no one expects that service to be in that small Eastern Wheat Belt town, but we do expect it to be in some of our region, bigger regional centres. And I think not only do we need to build houses, we need to invest in our social services. And I think we've heard that here today already. I actually prepared a slide thing today, which is unusual. Oh, thanks. It's up there already. Now, you, everyone will be familiar with this. I really like this housing continuum. Um, I first came across it as a, the Minister for Housing, and I'm sure a little different to this, but it was developed during the affordable, affordable housing strategy that was implemented in 2010 to 2020. I think Terry Redman was the first minister. Uh, minister Buzzle took it over and I inherited it towards the end. A really great way of looking at the problem in a different way. And I really acknowledge the fact that this is kind of like the cornerstone of the approach from Shelter WA and the, and the, and the sector. I really like it. I think it's it really helpful for policymakers like us to look where you've got to put your investment uh, in, into the solution. And it's not just at one end, it's a continuum and you need investment along the continuum to make sure it progresses. Um, I think one of the, but obviously, one of the very first things that need to happen is stable environment, stable house, stable home, because only after that can you address things like family and domestic violence, mental health issues, substance dependency or employment. 
So that's the first start of that, that journey along this continuum, but it shouldn't stop there. Um, another story when I was minister um, was that there was a policy in housing that probably still exists where if you turned 100 years old and you lived in a, a, a public house, you got free rent. And I remember I was minister, I was a fairly new minister, I had a new media advisor and we thought, let's go and see someone who's just turned 100 and say, congratulations, you've reached, you've get, now get free rent. Um, lovely people, uh, a lovely woman, she was living by herself. Um, I actually quite hated it because I thought it was a bit, it was a bit contrived and I apologise for that. But this, listen to this woman's story. She'd been in public housing for over 60 years. She had, was, she moved in just after she was married. She raised her family there. She had a son and a daughter. And she'd lived in this public housing for 60 years, over 60 years. And I thought to myself, why? Her husband had a job. She raised two children. And I remember that one of them turned up to the media thing in a BMW. So they've done quite well in life. Where was this lady's aspirations or this family's aspirations to home ownership out of that public housing situation? And um, if you see up here on public housing, which is the third ring, I would hate to see that as the roadblock to progression. I remember that we, uh, that, you know, and they were, they were from policies gone before. But in my mind, uh, we need investment from government to not only build new homes, we need to provide the services, but we also need to aspire people to home ownership so that people who are living in those public houses can move into their own home and the next person who's in desperate need at the other end of the continuum, down at the homelessness, can move into those spaces. We need to mobilise the assets of the Housing Authority to be able to do that. And we need to mobilise the aspirations of people to be able to do that. Um, so I'd hate to see that public housing becomes the roadblock. We know it's good. Once you get into public housing, it's a great opportunity because it's stable, you get services, and it's a relatively um, cheap rent. But people have to aspire to move on beyond that situation in my mind. Um, and how, so how do we do that? Um, and some of the programs that have been happening to, to as part of the affordable housing strategy, Key Start is critical to this state. And I know that this government has increased the loan book capacity just like the previous government did because we want to provide more opportunities for people to get that low income, low deposit home so they can aspire to home ownership. I know through uh, my consultation as Minister that every other state in Australia wishes they had Key Start. It's a critical point, it's a critical part of the policy solution for the, um, solving the housing situation in Western Australia. And given where banks are now in terms of their lending, Key Start is going to be more important than ever. Shared equity was an, is a great idea where lots of people can't afford the $300,000 loan. What they might be able to afford is a $150,000 loan, buy a house in partnership with a community housing organisation or the housing authority is a very good idea that we should promote and explore more. Uh, and when I notice in some of the literature about uh, 35 year olds feeling, how am I ever going to get into a home of my own? How am I ever going to be an affordable home and, and a house? Shared equity to me is one of those solutions. They've got some income, a steady job, they want to move into home ownership. Shared housing is the ability. Is that the time, Mr. Wolf? Sorry, tried that one. <laughs> the other one is um, how much time do I have left after that? One minute. Holy. Um, there's other programs, obviously, which um, are like the East Kimberley Traditional Housing Program, which is a, a, an opportunity to try to skill people in home ownership and budgeting, which was uh, rolled out by the previous government in the East and West Kimberley. I'll quickly move on to some of the policies where we think we should sit and addresses really along uh, that continuum. So obviously we need increased funding into crisis accommodation. That is one of the fundamentals to get people onto the continuum. We need more housing to get, deal with people who are in stress. We recently made an announcement in Albany where we're going to provide $2 million to the Albany Youth Support 
Association for Emergency Accommodation for Youth Homelessness in, in Albany. Um, other candidates around the state will be making similar announcements. And the important bit about this is working with local organisations to identify the local problem and the local solution. Uh, we need to be more connected to our communities to be able to do just like that. Regionalisation, I talked about it before. I never want to see another person sent to the Eastern Wheat Belt from some other region without any support networks. Obviously, we need to concentrate services into the regional, larger regional centres and um, mobilise the assets that they get back into those regions where they can get the appropriate, appropriate services. And I don't mean picking up whole families and moving them to the next town. Um, we don't want to do that. We want it to be a gradual transition, but to where they can get the services. Social housing, obviously, um, we need to... One key point I'd like to make is I really like the model where the housing authority had their own development arm. Because in my mind, that was about their ability to mobilise their own assets to deliver on their core business. The, uh, this government has uh, rationalised quite a lot of the departments. They've taken the land development uh, ability out of the housing authority and now just deal with houses and given it to uh, development WA. I'll be really interested to see how that works because in my mind, it now says that housing and department of communities, you need to go through the budgetary requirements to get your money to go and build more social housing. To me, that's a real risk because you know we all know the competing budgetary requirements when you go to the treasurer, you go to the, the cabinet and ask for a bit of money. It's a challenge thing. When the housing authority had their own ability to do that, I thought it was a better model. I'll be interested in seeing some evaluations. Um, affordable housing, we talked about, I like shared housing um, and obviously some key worker, worker accommodation in the bush and home ownership. Key start, that's the continuum basically. So, so I've run out of time there. Um, thank you, Colin Holt, everyone. The retiring Colin Holt. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for being with us. Please stay and uh, take some questions. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, I think one of the things that we've completely missed in the entire discussion is the causes of homelessness, which are largely poverty, inequality, racism and so forth. Uh, and no one's addressed the fundamental issue of income support, the fact that income support is inadequate and is unable to meet people's needs for a right to a proper home and a right to food and a right to health and social participation in community. So what I'd like to know is what our members going to do about what is a federal issue and that's income support. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Colin, do you want to have a go? So like I said, I think homelessness is a very individual reason and a very individual journey and there's lots of, lots of um, reasons why people find them homeless. I think um, income support has always been uh, the biggest challenges in terms of the federal government understanding what people are facing, especially in Western Australia. They're, they don't understand Western Australia, how it operates. We have particular challenges in our economy in terms of two geared paced economies. We have these boom bust cycles. We find people uh, in competing uh, in terms of higher rents, um, and higher services. Um, and I reckon that the federal government, there's no nationals from Western Australia who serve in the federal government, but there are colleagues here that do, um, really need to further understand how Western Australia's operate and we need more income and more social support to uh, be able to, for people to be able to afford to live and, and to maintain a rent and maintain a mortgage. Mm, great question. Um, yes. Hi, my name is Theresa Henry and I'm actually a community member. Um, I'd like to sort of make a statement and a very brief story. Um, so in 1981, my husband and I were expecting our third child and we were living in Denmark and we needed to come up to Perth for me to have a third child. So we came up and we walked into the Homes West office in Quinana at the time and we said that we needed accommodation. They said, come back in two hours and we'll have a key for you. So they gave us a key and we went into um, a three bedroom unit and we stayed there for quite a few months while I had my child. And then eventually went back to them and said, we've decided we're gonna move back to Denmark. Now, I think it was in roughly the, the end of the eighties, probably early nineties that, that we allowed 
whoever it was, to take away thousands and thousands of Holmes West apartments. And these were situated in Quinana, Balga, um, Kubalup, and throughout the Perth area. And what we did was we allowed them to take away these apartments and they turned them into condominiums and they refurbished them and they were beautiful and they put them to the market of people to buy. Some people could afford to buy them because they went as low as $23,000. And that was great for the people that were working and could actually get into there. But what happened to these thousands and thousands of flats that went to condominiums? We never replaced them. And I'm talking about thousands. I don't know the figures, but I know how many areas had these places. So we did not replace these houses and not everybody could afford to buy a house. And I think the, the, the minister at the beginning, the first minister said, um, don't quote me on it, that we demolished a 300 um, block of units somewhere. Well, wouldn't it be obvious that we actually build 300 units first? before we actually demolish them 300. So now the population from way back to 1981 to now is three, fourfold, yet we have a lot less public housing now than we did 40 years ago. Uh, thank you. I wonder if you can respond yeah, it's, to um, that. I, it's really interesting. I, 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 the Housing Authority had a lot of land and a lot of assets. And in my mind, it's around them mobilising them to build more homes and to change the mix of housing as well um, in terms of, um, and when I think about, it works, in, it works in the city because often land values are higher and housing values are higher. But if you go to regional areas where the land values are lower and housing is lower, it doesn't work. You can't sell that one house and build five more like you can in Perth. So that takes a direct government investment into regional Western Australia to make sure that the economies work up. Um, and if you look at the Housing Authority as a whole, um, they need to mobilise their assets wherever they are to build wherever the need is. Um, but then, yeah, need to build more. Thank you for the question. One last question, yes, please. Hi, um, so, yeah. Hi I'm Alice. I'm from Circle Green Community Legal, um, formerly tenants of WA. Mm -hmm. um, more of a comment, I suppose, than a question, and it's a comment to everybody rather than just yourself. Um, although I don't necessarily agree that um, people would consider public housing or staying in public housing because it's the most stable. Um, anyone who's lived in public housing or worked with people living in public housing knows that often it's more unstable, um, in fact, than a private rental, um, and certainly obviously more unstable than um, home ownership. Um, more on your comment around people needing to aspire to home ownership. Um, I don't think that's the problem, is, is people's aspirations towards it. Um, I think what we need is a reform of what the Residential Tenancies Act currently is to reflect what the market is now. People aren't renting on a path to home ownership eventually. People are renting for life, whether by necessity or by choice. Um, and the legislation needs to reflect that that's the case and that that's the new normal, rather than trying to go back to this path to home ownership approach. So I think you're right, I, and I, maybe my language is, no, wasn't quite right. I think it's about government policies that deliver on those aspirations of home ownership. So, um, so we can do things like the Tenancy Act and change that to make it, give it, give it uh, um, opportunity more. Um, and there's things like the shared equity um, policy also, which is also about how do we actually, as a government, put in policy that actually gets people or realise that aspiration. And yes, yeah, some people want to rent for the whole life. No worries, I, you know, I'm generalising, but I wouldn't want people to be, like I said, that blocker in public housing where they, once they get there, they, they never think about moving on. And maybe it's about how do we help them more? And I'll talk very briefly because I uh, got cut off about the East Kimberley Transitional Housing Program, which is about working with tenants who are public housing tenants, giving them, working with them to give them appropriate skills that they can then move into private rental home ownership. So it's about those policy settings more than anything else. Thank you for the question. Uh, we'll have one final question for Colin Holt. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jane Pickett in uh, Oliver Street. Uh, I've been there for 30 years, uh, but now I've camped down the Lind River and been there for say 10, uh, amongst uh, uh, palm trees. Uh, 
I did fill in for uh, accommodation. Uh, that was uh, sort of put out to us. And uh, it never came through. So I sort of said, oh, they came up with another one. And I, oh, no, no, don't worry about it because the, the first one never worked. So to, to live in a hard life, but to come from a family where uh, my great nan is from England and my pop was a glibly war man and to be not noticed. Uh, yeah, uh, but Monday from the domestic airport. That's me and my mum. Uh, domestic airport wanted me to go and sign something, but I never went there. And then back in '93, uh, uh, they could have been a part of uh, street fights, helping them or whatever. Uh, but. All I, all I want to uh, say it's very um, uh, lonely uh, to uh, live in the spot where you hear cars and people walk past and jogging and uh, do nothing and we wake up in the morning. And you, and, and you gotta you gotta walk so far to get a uh, wash your face and hand whatever. Uh, but I don't call it hard, but I call it uh, uh, un, unliving ways. Yeah, I, brother, that is hard. That is hard. Um, how can we do better? I mean, it's, you know, we're a first world country, you know, we're going through a boom. Uh, the minister mentioned that word a little while ago and, and you don't hear, I, I wasn't sure when I was going to hear the word boom again in state politics, to be honest with you, um, but, but it has been said out loud this morning. How do we marry that up against individual stories like this, um, where we, we can't look after our own? So I think um, one of the ministers also talked about the competing priorities of, of, um, of the state government. And just like the housing continuum, I think you've got to tackle it all the way along the continuum and all the way along the economy. So it is about infrastructure builds that provide job opportunities as much as making sure that we invest in the services to help um, people who are homeless and to, and to get off the streets and to provide the, the adequate service in place. It's really hard for government. It's all about the competing priorities that um, groups all over the state come for. And in, you'll go to a forum tomorrow where the Chamber of Minerals and Energy will have a different strategic plan and you'll have the um, Chamber of Commerce and Industries who want a new focus for government. Um, the challenge of any government is to marry all those priorities up to deliver for our people, because that's what they're actually elected to do. Yeah. Um, and it's about how does society in Western Australia grow and provide um, better opportunities for everybody. Um, Colin Holt, we have to move on. I'm really sorry. We, we, time is pressure. Oh, please let us. Okay. Herbert, Herbert, I, I respect you, I, Mr. Brofo. I promise I respect you. The stories, uh, Mr. Brofo, Mr. Brofo. I, 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 I have to, Mr. Brofo, you have to. You need to come sit and talk to the Absolutely. We need to live in your shoes. I agree with you. Until we walk in your shoes. But then you have, we're hearing your story. We respect you. Mr. Brofo, we respect you. 
we, your stories, your stories are our stories. They're heartbreaking. I can't tell you. I know, but now we can't answer that question. Yeah. No, Mr. Brofo, we have to move on because. Uh, please, can I just ask? We respect you. We will sit down. I'm sorry, I get it. I hear it. We all hear it. I promise you. We hear it. We have to move on. We must move on because we're keeping these people here now. They've got jobs to go to. There are people that have come. Mr. Brofo, I respect you. I promise I respect you. Please, we need to move on. Ladies and gentlemen, we can have a round of applause for Mr. Brofo. I mean, it's not without. Okay. Now, let's move on. We have got two more speakers to go. Two more speakers to go. And we're going to hear from them. And we're going to treat them with the respect. We started this with Auntie Millie coming and saying to us, let's be, res right? let's be respectful to each other. And we are going to continue to be respectful to each other and to everyone in the audience. Uh, we have got two more guests to hear from. And the first one is somebody that has lived the experience that we're talking about this morning. Uh, we have the Honourable Tom Clifford, MLC, who is with us, who is from the East Metropolitan Region, represents the Greens WA. Um, he understands what it's like to, uh, to do it tough, uh, living in a, a, a house, a, a housing commission house with his mum and his young, uh, young brothers and sisters, uh, and has been a member of the parliament since 2017. Uh, uh, I'm glad that we got you up here. I apologise. Uh, you know, I'll be honest, it's hard to know how to handle a situation like that, right? Except we can listen to it. And I'll say that. I mean, we listen to it. We have to learn. We have to learn. Um, with, with that uh, now, we are, like, I did say that I was going to be a bit bad at running time. I think I can confess uh, that I'm very bad. Uh, it's eight minutes to midday, and uh, we've got two speakers to work our way through. Uh, so if I can ask you to please welcome the Honourable Tom, uh, Tim Clifford, I beg your pardon, uh, MLC representing the Greens. Would you please make him welcome? Thank you, Russell. That's, um, uh, and uh, before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Wajak Noongar people, and pay my respects to elders both past, present, and emerging leaders. Um, we've heard from a lot of speakers today, but I'd just like to put out here that we, we're in a crisis. We're in absolute housing crisis, whether it Housing affordability, down to homelessness, top to bottom, we're in an absolute crisis. And from my perspective, everybody deserves a decent and stable place to live. And housing is a human right. Before COVID-19 struck, thousands of Western Australians were homeless while hundreds of thousands of families were struggling with enormous rents that they could barely afford. Now many more Australians are facing homelessness and housing insecurity. While emergency housing is needed, we also need to plan. Uh, we also need a plan for ending rent poverty in this state. And my office, uh, more recently, uh, we've conducted two surveys to the community, and I'd just like to share a couple of stories that um, I've, that have been sent to, through to my office in the previous couple of days. This is from one renter who says, "I'm renting the same property for four and a half years. Last month, I got told by my real estate agent." about the rental increase of $35 per week from the 1st of April, 2021. I spoke to the real estate agent and about, agent about not being able to afford that much of an increase. And within days, I got an eviction notice. The second uh, person that uh, sent through their story, they said, the rental agency hinted that I would not get approval for renewing my rental lease unless I was willing to pay for and install fresh turf despite the fact that when I moved in less than a year ago, the lawn was dry and dead with large sandy patches 
They also wanted me to increase the rent. Uh, they also wanted to increase the, increase the rent. So instead of fighting it, I moved back with my mother, bringing my five-year-old daughter with me. We now drive 40 minutes to go to school every day because there are no rentals available that I can afford. Plus, the previous landlord is trying to keep my bond in order to redo the house, new curtains, despite saying that they insisted on keeping the original curtains when I inquired as they were told and also need new carpets. And are also trying to claim the cockroaches that were there from the start when it was clearly not my fault. And this, even though I had already laid fresh turf before I left, I was trying to figure out if I could stay, but can't afford the increase. Now, I recognize that COVID is an extraordinary time, but some of these issues could have been prevented if we had adequate rental reform here in WA. Renters are the new norm. And I think the speaker earlier on today said that we need to rejig what we actually see is the new norm as people are facing rentals for the rest of their lives. Like forget housing affordability. I was mocked in parliament when I said young people can't afford to afford a home because the actual housing affordability is nowhere near it was where it was in the early 80s when the when the opposition when the member of parliament was reciting it back to me when they could buy their first home. It's actually it's actually harder and a lot of people don't realize that. So that's why um, following the following um, the rental surveys and these people's stories coming in, we committed to putting forward of, of banning no ground evictions, limiting the number of rent in increases, in increases and ensuring fair mechanisms to determine rent increases and providing fair minimum notice. Also would in introduce mandatory man maintenance, security and efficiency standards, allowing renters to make their, ha their house a home by permitting minor modifications, accessibility modifications and banning no, no pet clauses. We'd also put forward a policy ensuring better protections for boarders, lodgers, and other vulnerable groups, including students, people with disabilities, and, and people who live, with, live in mental health residential groups, group homes, provided additional funding to support tenants advocacy services. It is critical that we support renters in the current, in the current market, but it's also critical we increase social housing stock to prevent Western Australian families from facing rent poverty by being forced to compete in an unattainable renting market. If WA had adequate social and affordable housing stocks, perhaps the private rental market vacancies would, wouldn't have dropped to the lowest in 40 years at 0.8%. And perhaps renters wouldn't be facing a predicted 20% rise in rents. There is an unfit, unmet need of almost 60,000 social and affording, affordable homes in WA and almost 25,000 people living in limo waiting for almost two years on the social housing wait list for a place to call home. And more than 9,000 homeless or, or, or people are sleeping rough every night. And my, um, uh, my colleague, the Honourable Alison Zamon, will talk more about that later. We need, to, we need to be very clear about what's going on in our state. We need to provide the houses. It's all about priorities. If we provided the houses, if we actually committed to these builds, our policy is to build 15,000 new homes uh, in the next three years. And I note that the, um, that the Victorian Labor government had already committed to 12,000 homes. So we are in the richest state, probably in the Southern hemisphere, if not the world, and we can't even provide houses for people. I think that is an incredible indictment of successive governments, considering we have people who are in crisis that we, we'd heard from so many people here today. And just reflecting on my own story, I, you know, I, I fled domestic violence when I was young, you know, in Katanning in you know, 1998, 97. We fled a situation where social housing was three months on the waiting list. Now it's more than seven to nine years. Like if my family could find a, like we stayed at my auntie's house, but if we couldn't find a place in three months back then, what's it like for people waiting out there for seven to nine years? And I think that's what the focus and people forget is that behind every one of these people on this bit of paper, the numbers, there's a person who is in tragic need of, an, of assistance. And it all comes down to priorities. And I think we need to think more about that. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, Tim Clifford uh, has really like a, a lived experience too. Um, thank you for sharing your story with us this morning. I apologize for calling you Tom. Um, uh, Tim will take questions from you for 
Uh, the next few minutes, we've got one from online, firstly. Hi there. Um, this person's been asking this question of all parties, actually, and they want to know how many social homes that you plan to build. Uh, 15,000. And that, um, that comes with, uh, and mandating 20% 20, uh, 20 of all new builds be affordable house, houses, and 10% of the housing stock would be social. Okay, we'll get, uh, let's get a microphone to you and you can ask that question. Thanks for being patient. Okay. Hello, uh, Hope Alexander. I noticed that nobody up the panel there has talked about a lot of workers are now casual now. I was going, I wanted to ask the last speaker, how can you get a mortgage if you're casual only of working a few hours a week? I mean, mm. has anyone got the answer to that? You know, I, I think we talked a bit about JobKeeper and JobSeeker before. Um, there's been a real emphasis on, um, you know, on what's going on. I think COVID has really shone a, light, shone a light on what's actually happening in our country. And that's a lot of people are facing casualised workforces. I worked on contract for years. I was a FIFO worker um, balancing a mortgage. Um, and you want to talk about accessibility to house, housing affordability, like being able to buy a home. If you're a casual worker, it's nearly impossible. It's nearly impossible to get a rental. And job, job seeker and job keeper are about to be wind down in the next month. And that's going to double hit people when, um, when they lift the moratorium as well. So I think our state government and opposition should be advocates for these people to not only um, fight to make sure casualisation isn't, doesn't continue to go out of control, but also the fact that we need to make sure that job keeper and job seeker are at a, a, adequate levels. Thank you for the question. One more, yes. So, thank you. I'm Sarah from Midless again. So we're not a homeless service provider at all, but in working in the community doing financial counselling and tenancy advocacy and family law, what we're seeing is an absolute avalanche of people who are either about to be homeless or are currently homeless. Mm -hmm. When COVID happened, I, I was one of the people who thought, you know, fingers crossed for a second wave because when wealthy people lined up at Centrelink, all of a sudden income support was so high that because it was no way you could live on new start, let's not be silly, you know. So all of a sudden the income support went through the roof. And I asked a couple of the people who've been long-term street present, if it's 14, 1500 a fortnight, maybe you could rent a, pri a private property. And what, what they were telling me was, the third question on the form is address. Yeah. The fourth question on the form is phone number, and I have neither. And even if I go to the real estate and look at the rental opening, and I walk there, and I dress nice, and I turn up, there's 20 SUVs willing to bid mm. more yeah. money and pay a year in advance for those properties. So they can't yeah. get a foot in the door if they try. Priority one, social housing. If, yeah. you are, if I'm a woman on the street with my children, seven years. If I'm a woman and I have three, three children, my 15 year old teenage son means I can't go to a refuge because I have to choose to leave him outside or, or all of us stay outside together. So I think you're right, we do need investment in social housing and the suggestions that are being put forward and the commitments are fantastic. We do need social housing. We do need reform to the Residential Tenancy Act. We do need to support yeah. people to buy homes because it's not aspirational, you're right, it's, it's opportunity. I think they're all wonderful solutions. Yes. But today, when I go back to the office, I will ring entry point four times again, and I will get the same message on the phone, which says the mailbox is full. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it was actually the end of, obviously we've been really tight with time. It was actually the end of my speech. We need to, we need to rule out rent bidding. There's, a, there's 100 people lining up for a, one room and they're taking the real estate agent to a side. And you've got to ask the question, is that right? And REWA and, and people need to be advocates for people, not, not investors and not uh, and anything else. I was actually door knocking the other week and I was in the lounge room of someone who ha is on disability, who has three kids, who also uh, said that they were facing a rent increase of $60 a week. They told the landlord that they couldn't afford to do it and they'd been in this house. They were a good tenant for five to six years and they were told that they had to get out and they had nowhere to go. And then when they sent friends to go and look at rentals for them, they'll they'll pit it against other rent, other people looking to rent, and that just and that just blows everything out. So we need to have a commitment that we can we're going to outlaw this. We also need to cap rent increases as well. It's an absolute disgrace that you're allowed to gouge like 20% above above market 
Just because you can, it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we'll just get a microphone to you there. I've just got um, a quick question for all, all of you. And Tim, I've, I've worked with Tim before. He really supported some things that I did in Midland to bring educational awareness. He's so genuine, absolute genuine person. So thank you. And, and um, because of his lived experience, I believe, in this area. The question I have is can whether the current government or future government, there's a lot of COVID money being floating around, floating around right now. Can you put urgent, build houses and build them quick, don't take three years to do it because you know there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be homeless, not only the ones that already are that need housing, but we need to address that as well as the ones that are, are going to be home. There, it's just going to be an incredible mm. crisis. So. Mm. Can we do it fast? I know that, look how fast everybody got COVID, extra COVID money. That happened in an instant. So let's, let's put the money, and I know it can be made, it's just a decision and a restructuring of where the resources go. Can that money be, be redirected quickly into housing and houses, I know, can be built within six months, not eight, not nine to 12 months. And the other question I have is, can it go into social housing and, and quickly? And, the, and, and then the other, there's one more question, and that is in relation to the person wanting to buy a house down the track who's on casual wages or not on any wages at all, why is it going, trying to apply for a joint asset key start that I have to earn over 70,000 a year to even be eligible. Why can't that be reduced right down to 50 or 40 or something All like right. that to make it more accessible? Got to move on, Deborah. Th thank you uh, for that. Do you want to have a, a uh, Yeah, I'd, I'd just say, yeah, quick. as you said, priorities, as I mentioned before, Victorian government, $5 billion, 12,000 new builds in the coming years, uh, retrofitting eight, I think it's 750 plus million dollars to retrofit um, social housing with more energy efficiency, the lower cost building. It is priorities, um, but yeah, your, your questions um, to the yeah to the government and where those thresholds with, with Key Start and everything are should be put straight to them. Uh, would you please thank Tim Clifford and I'll say remember the North East region for being with us from the Greens. Our last speaker today, everybody, is uh, Alison Zamon, MLC, the Honourable. She's the member for North Metropolitan Region with Greens WA um, and was elected to the WA Legislative Council first in 2008 and then again in 17. In between those parliamentary terms, uh, she was president of the WA Mental Health Association. Um, she is now the Greens spokesperson for homelessness and mental health, as well as 27 other uh, portfolio responsibilities. Would you please make the Honourable Alison Zamon welcome. Thanks, Russell. Um, I also wish to acknowledge we're, we're meeting on Wajak Nongabuja and to pay my respect to the elders and also to acknowledge those First Nations people who are still here, who are, here, who are with us in, in the room. Um, we've heard a lot today. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm feeling a bit emotionally exhausted going through this. And I think that it's, I want to unpack some of this a little bit. Um, Colin basically hit the nail on the head in, in one regard. He talked about the role of government needing to juggle competing interests and needing to make a political determination as to where they want to ultimately land. Well, the Greens have, are very clear about where we are landing. We are landing on the side of human rights. That is our obligation. That is what we stand for. And that is what our platform is actually based on. We believe there is a role for government to play, as significant role for government to play in terms of providing housing, particularly for those in our community who are the most vulnerable, either looking at being vulnerable idea, possibly for a lifetime, but also people who find themselves temporarily in a vulnerable situation. And that means that we are talking about serious investment, making sure it's a priority. I'm going to talk about some of the issues around homelessness specifically, because I also want to acknowledge that it isn't just about money. Sometimes it's about policy settings. There is a big role to be played at the national level. Um, what, we haven't even touched on the issue of people deciding to hoard houses, for example, for investment purposes. So that's an 
another thing that we're actually that perhaps we need to talk about. Since when has housing um, become something which can be deprived um, of, of people? It is a basic human right. But there is a policy settings here at the state level as well that we need to look at. One of the first things that the Greens would be doing, and we've been advocating for from the very beginning, is to abolish the three strikes eviction policy and to end the eviction of children. We also want to see the, the end of the eviction of people who have serious mental health issues um, from social housing. I represent those people often. And I've represented them when I was outside of Parliament and I've represented them when I'm in Parliament as well. And if the government ever tells you that it's not happening, that is not true. I've got people who I'm assisting right now. I've got people who rang me as recently as yesterday who are looking at eviction proceedings because they have got serious mental health issues. How is this still able to happen? This is a matter of a policy setting which can be immediately addressed and, is a, and, and has to be addressed, and that is a responsibility of government. Obviously, the Greens are about in, investing in individualised and person-driven person services to make sure that people can stay in their homes. Again, you want to talk about money? It is more expensive to not provide these services for people. It is more expensive to have people homeless than to ensure that people are given what they need in their homes so that they are able to live their best possible lives. This is something that we are talking about for people who've got mental health issues, people with disability, and um, people who um, find themselves, if for a whole range of reasons, needing to have a, a, a range of complex supports. We need to make sure we are investing in accommodation options so that people who are leaving hospital and youth justice detention and out of home care or prison have a home to go to. And at the moment, far too many of those people do not. It is a fact. I was asking questions of this government um, only in this term about what was happening, what was happening with children who'd been kept, who are being kept in Bankshire Hill, who had been determined by a judge to, to best not be there, Youth Offenders Act people. Can anyone please remember what? What the purpose of it is, keep children out of prison who don't need to be there, who were in Bankshire Hill because there was no suitable accommodation for that. Now, that is diabolical and I'm enraged about that and everybody should be enraged about that. These are human rights abuses. Let's take it to the UN. Um, anyway, we also obviously need to address the fundamental co um, causes of homelessness. The Greens have been actually at the forefront of talking at a federal level about raising the rate. We're going to continue banging on about that. You're right. And what you said about what the person who said it before, um, didn't COVID really highlight just how we, how absolutely um, unworkable our current safety net system is? And isn't it interesting when when you have broader populations that are suddenly exposed to how diabolical it is? But there's the basics. Can we please fund the 10 year mental health and alcohol and other drug services plan? Um, I heard Taryn on the radio this morning. You nailed it. Thank you very much. Really trying to draw attention to the fact that we have not invested in those services. We've still got people with disability who aren't connected in with the NDIS. Uh, we've got people who are leaving hospital with, uh, with huge burdens of health costs, and these things are leading to homelessness. These are all policy settings that this government needs to address and this government can address. And of course, we have talked about um, the issue of casualisation, precarious employment. It's a big picture stuff. But I, and at the end of the day, we also recognise that particularly as our First Nations people who are disproportionately bearing the burden of being homeless. And um, we absolutely support the implementation of a genuine co-design approach um, to housing design and to build culturally appropriate social housing um, where it's required. A few things that the Greens won't do. One of the things the Greens won't do is we're not going to get rid of social housing uh, before you've at least determined that you've got somewhere else for people to go. I cannot believe that, that, that we've ended up with 1,100 less social houses than what this government had to start with in the first place. We've gone entirely in the wrong, in the wrong direction. There's a whole range of announcement that have, announcements that have been made by this government, which when you start to unpick it, you, you basically it doesn't, it is not up to muster. Um, we are talking about key start, which is not social housing, uh, affordable housing, which is not social housing. Um, and even with the common ground, which the Greens absolutely support and we think is a good start. Um, it's a great initiative, but construction of that first site has not even begun and the second site was only announced in December 2020. I'm sick and tired of hearing announcements only to discover because of good journalism that it turns out that they're not announcements at all. And I'm thinking about things like the YHA announcement. I know that this government is keen to make sure that the homelessness debacle is shoved under the, uh, under the rug um, before, before March the 13th. But I think we need to have our eye towards the future. I'm going to ask you 
you to think about um, who you want to have in Parliament who is going to basically make sure this government um, can be better. Um, as Tony has said, we know that the McGowan government is going to get back in. The question is, are they going to just be able to get a free kick to do whatever they like in business as usual, or are we going to make sure that we've got enough people standing up to that and make and keeping them to account? Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Alison Simon, uh, MLC is with us. And uh, now we have just time for uh, some questions. Thank you for waiting. Thank you, Alison. Jonathan Shapiro from Lived Hi, Experience, yeah. with Australian Council Lived Experience. Look, I asked you the question because you and Tim rattle cages. And I know that from your federal um, ex-member, Scott Ludlam, who actually helped me. Look, as far as homeless is concerned, what we've been talking about here today is the fact that actually anyone out of homelessness and into a house. What we don't talk about is the problems associated with long-term chronic homeless that continue to pervert the, the existing um, medical issues. When I last saw Tim, I walked in with two legs. Today, I walked with a cane. And that was because of the fact that I've spent nearly 22 hours on the operating table over the last three years. And I've got many of the lived experience buddies and uh, colleagues and everybody that have gone through medical issues mm -hmm. that have absolutely devastating. I put the government on notice in regards to this to understand the fact that chronic homeless is causing so much as far as dollars are concerned in medical issues. I would like to see the Greens absolutely rattle the cages to understand. Um, an ambulance service for someone who's homeless is 1100 bucks because we don't have ambulance insurance. West Australia is the only state in Australia that does not provide ambulance services. You've got to pay for it. And I can't. I've got I've got a eleven hundred dollar bill that I'm paying off with Baycorp because I couldn't afford yeah. the fact of actually going. And I've got colleagues that have gone through. Dr. Amanda Stafford runs a brilliant service at Perth Royal Hospital, and that's for the homeless itself. Mm -hmm. But she has homeless people that are escorted there under ambulance, and then they get a bill for eleven hundred dollars. Put the government on notice in mm -hmm. regards to that. It's something that they need to do. And I ask you, please, to follow through and rattle the pages to do with medical services. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank ex homeless. You. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And I, I, I want to just pick out on a few points. That, I mean, this is the point about the issue of cost. It does my head in when I hear when I hear gov governments talk about you know how ex expensive and all this sort of stuff. It's expensive not to deal with this. That's exactly the point. And that's if you only care about the dollars, right? It's that's if you're prepared to dismiss the human cost of of what it means and actually say, okay, well, we're not actually not going to worry about that. Um, I know that the lack of investment in supports for people um, to be able to get what they need uh, from a mental health, from a health perspective, from a disability perspective. Donna, I remember talking to you. Um, hello, how are you going? And, um, the, and the lack of supports um, around disability. And it, yeah, we, go, okay, well, we can talk about that if you like. And it's, it's disgraceful and unnecessary. And it's the, these are the pathways that leave people not only into homelessness, but long-term homelessness as well. So we know that the, we know that it is not cost effective. In fact, homelessness is not cost effective. So let's actually bite the bullet. But I do want to make one comment, and that is that you have to have care and compassion in order to be able to try to deal with that. And I've been appalled, frankly, by some of the commentary that I've heard from the Premier in response to the tent cities. There's been a fair bit of dog whistling over this, can we be very clear? So talk, talking about, um, talking, trying to basically paint people who are very vulnerable as though somehow nah, not really quite worthy. And that is what, and that is actually what's been happening. And, I've, and I see the commentary that comes out of it. And I'll tell you what, there are a lot of people from the far right who go, yeah, right on, that's right. Yeah, because that's the problem. What we have done is we've created a situation which such the comparison with the bushfires was brilliant. Because the thing about bushfires is we, paint, we are able to go with a narrative of blameless people. But what we do when it comes to homelessness is we have point blame. It must be you. It must be because you're not aspirational. It must be because you've somehow brought this upon yourself. And those of us who have actually, who have actually worked in, the, in these complex worlds know that it's far from the case. Um, I, I myself have come really close. Um, anyway, I don't want to talk about my teenage... But certainly when I was, for me to make the jump from being a sole parent on a pension um, to being able to get into my first home, my, what I'm, the decision I made um, was to stop eating. I got down to 41 kilos and that's how I saved my money. Um, I, I managed to, I kept, my kid was fed, but that's how I got the money. And they are the sorts of choices that people make 
They are the choices that people make. You know, and I was, I made that choice and I have a lot of advantages people don't. I'm white, um, I've, had the, I've had the advantage of an education. Um, and at that point, I was in recovery from quite serious mental health issues. So go me, I've managed to get to that point. Um, but that was not, but that's what, that was not, that was not easy. And that was in a, at a point when housing was even more affordable than it is now. Um, I wouldn't be able to do, make that same journey now. And, um, and, but we need to get past blaming people um, for finding themselves without appropriate shelter. And we need to remember that it is a fundamental human right. And has those um, hierarchy of needs, people. Uh, thank you very much, Alison. Stay there. Um, our final question for the forum. Well, I appreciate you having the microphone. My question is, I'm a disabled person, but I've got a 24-year-old autistic child. Yeah. He has separation anxiety. There's no social housing out there for mothers with kids mm. with disabilities. Mm. When are we going to be heard? Mm. Yeah, I met, and I met your son too. He's a pretty funny guy, actually. Um, yeah, so, and, and I mean, that's the answer. So we need to, we can't evade a fundamental responsibility of government. And that is realising that there is always going to be a role for government to make sure that people have houses, to make people, that, to, that people have social housing. And that means investment. That means not ending up with less houses than what we started. Um, it means making sure that we're doing the serious investment of what's actually required. Um, that's, and, and it's also about making the priority about those policy settings. So we do have a plan for 15,000 houses, but I'm, also, I'm aware we're up against um, policy settings where priority has been given to put workers you know, doing up people's expensive kitchens rather than prioritising the builders of, of, of social houses. Now, that's a decision of government, okay? They're, they're the sorts of priorities that people can make. Um, but we will continue to bang on about this. We know where we sit um, within, within the continuum, what it was we stand, for, we stand for. We're not compromised. We're not compromised by developers, none of these things. This is what we stand for and this is what we're going to continue to be talking about and continue to hold any government to account on. Would you please thank Alison Zaman for being with us. Thank you, Alison. And would you, in the same breath, please welcome back to thank our guest speakers today, the Chief Executive Officer of Shelter WA, Michelle McKenzie, everybody. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, thanks for your patience. We've gone a wee bit over time. Um, I just would really like to thank the candidates um, for your, your words of wisdom, for your insights and your thoughts. Um, in the lead up to the election. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending our Zoom audience. Um, I'd like again to thank Annie Millie for her wonderful welcome to country. Um, I'd also like to thank the Shelter WA team who have worked behind the scenes enormously to make this happen. Um, thank you for your attendance. Um, I just would like to ask the candidates if they'd be okay to have a group photo. Is that okay? Brilliant. <laughs> We've had that um, on the stage, so we all agree. Um, and. Um, Thank you again. Um, please go go home, be safe um, during this period, and I look forward to seeing you at our next uh, event. Thank you. <laughs>